let us call ourselves to worship. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, the flood would have swept us away. The raging waters would have gone over us. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let us worship God together. And let us sing now together. As we continue in our worship together, it is right and good to confess before our God the ways that we have not lived up to God's calling. So I invite you to pray with me now. O sanctifying Spirit, fill us, we pray. Right our many wrongs, straighten our crooked paths, and purify our stained hearts. And in so doing, Call us again to your way of justice and righteousness, that in our following, others may see, hear, and follow also. O oh God, if you are for us, who can be against us? For you did not withhold from us your own Son, but gave him up for all of us, and have justified us in the name of Jesus Christ, who died Yes, and who was raised, and who is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. We thank you, O God, that now nothing can separate us from the love of God that we have in Jesus Christ. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. Amen, and we do welcome you to this virtual worship of the First Presbyterian Church of Hamilton Square. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, Reverend Doug Cornelius, and with Reverend Kyle Debler, we welcome you to our worship. We are also joined by Julie and Eric, our music staff, and always thankful to Bob Fisher for all the work that he puts in getting these services out to you. A few announcements as we begin our worship. The first is that the church retreat is very quickly approaching. If you have not signed up yet, contact the church office or the retreat team or one of the pastors. Let us know you want to attend. Uh, we've had an explosion of signups recently, and we hope that you will be the next one on that list. 
Also, the Christmas cantata seems like it's far away, but Christmas will be here before we know it. So if you are a vocalist who would like to join our choir for the Christmas cantata, I encourage you to be in contact with Eric or Julie or the church office, and we will get you plugged in and let you know what you need to know. Also, we have an upcoming uh, event for the children of our church. It's an education night and a chance for parents to go enjoy themselves without kids. The kids will come here and also enjoy themselves, learn a lot about scripture, and grow in their friendships with one another. That is on October 1st from 6 to 8 p.m. here at the church. We hope that your kids will come and all children are welcome, church members or not. Just contact the church if you need more information. And finally, we have two flower arrangements here. So thankful for the folks that help make our chancel area more beautiful. Uh, one arrangement this week is given uh, in loving memory of Marion Hopak, Sandy Hopak, and James Hopak from the Hopak family. And the other, given in loving memory of Pop-Up, Albert Lounsbury, from daughter Donna O'Sullivan and Donna's family. We thank you for these flower arrangements, and we lift up their memory with you and hold you and them in prayer. Let us continue in our worship. Good morning. I want to share a brief message with the kids. So if you're a kid and you are worshiping at home with us, I want you to gather close so that you can see and hear. It's good to be talking with you today. Well, I want to tell you a story about Jesus and his friends. You know, Jesus had this group of his 12 best friends. We call them the disciples. And, you know, his friends... They wanted to follow Jesus, they wanted to serve Jesus, but they didn't always get it right. They tried hard, but they just sometimes messed up. And this is a story about what happened one time when his friends messed up and how Jesus responded. It was Jesus' friend John who came to Jesus and said, we found someone who was doing work in your name. He was healing people and helping people believe in you. And you know what? We told him to stop because we didn't know who he was. He wasn't traveling with us. We had never seen him before. We didn't even know his name. And so we assumed that if we didn't know who he was, you didn't know who he was either. We told him to cut it out. I hope that's okay. We were just trying to help. And you know what Jesus said? He said, if you see people who are doing good work in the world and they are doing it because they say they love me and they are following me, you shouldn't stop them. You should help them. And then he said, you know what? Remember that child we talked about last week? If there is anybody who keeps one of those kids from being able to believe in me and follow me and serve me, well, then you're not following me the right way. Find a better way to follow me. And then he said, well, rather than focusing on how other people are serving me and following me, you know what the better thing to do is? It's better for you to worry about how you're following me and serving me. Maybe you could think about that at home this week. How do you follow Jesus? How do you serve Jesus? Maybe are there some better ways that you can think of to follow Jesus? Not that what you're doing right now is bad, but maybe there are some ways that you could do it even better. That's what Jesus wants us to think about this week. Can you do that? All right. Well, let's pray together. I'll pray some words and you pray after me. Dear God, thank you for your love. Thank you for inviting me to follow you. 
Help me to serve you and to follow you with everything that I am. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, you might remember an uproar a few years ago about a painting of Jesus that was in a small church in the town of Borja, Spain. The painting was called Eke Homo, and it was painted on plaster in about the year 1930 by an artist named Elias Garcia Martinez. And over the years, moisture in the church had begun to deteriorate the painting so that pieces of it began flaking away. Well, recognizing that something needed to be done and knowing that nobody ever needs an engraved invitation to serve the church, 81-year-old Cecilia Jimenez donned her smock, grabbed her paintbrushes, and she got right to work. And she worked tirelessly to restore that painting. She tried to recapture the artist's original vision, and she tried to bring life back to this old painting that time had slowly worn away. Well, it didn't turn out exactly the way that everybody had thought. And although the botched restoration job has become a tourist attraction in its own right, and it has raised tens of thousands of euros for charities, there was even a documentary that was filmed about her work. Most art critics agree that the painting has been ruined. When somebody asked her about her works, Cecilia Jimenez claimed, I was just trying to help. I was just trying to help. That's that's one of those sayings that nobody ever likes to hear, right? Because when we hear that, that means when somebody's trying to tell us that they were just trying to help, we know we are in some serious trouble. Maybe you've come across a a small child with a magic marker who was just trying to help by adding a pop of color where they thought it should go. Probably not where the interior decorator was going to put it, though, huh? Maybe you're baking cookies or a cake with a young assistant who just wants to help, and it takes you twice as long and three times as many ingredients because it turns out that your assistant isn't really all that helpful. What about when a dog or a cat presents a mouse or some other creature to you with that look in their eye of, don't you love it? I was just trying to help. And of course, all that means is that you have a really gross job ahead of you. Well, how can we be helpful to Jesus? That's the question that we're looking at in today's passage. What does it mean to be a helpful disciple? What does it mean to work for Jesus and not against him? Well, let's listen now to God's word from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 38 through 50. Listen now for God's word. John said to Jesus, Teacher, We saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he wasn't following us. But Jesus said, don't stop him. For no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able to soon afterwards speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For very truly, I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. But if any of you puts a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble... Cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. 
It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Now salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Well, once again, the disciples have completely missed the point. It's an ironic twist, but the disciples have come across somebody who is casting out demons in Jesus' name, something that not even the 12 were able to do just a few verses before. And they tell him that he needs to cut it out because they're not following them. Did you catch that? All this talk about denying oneself and becoming the last of all and the servant of all and welcoming even children in Jesus' name as Jesus' own representatives. And the disciples are upset that there is someone doing the things that Jesus did and doing them in Jesus' name. And he is doing it all with the audacity to fail to check in with the disciples and make sure that everything is okay. After Jesus had laid it out in terms so simple that even a child could understand that it wasn't all about them, but that it was all about him. That it didn't matter whether they were great, it mattered whether Jesus was great. The disciples are upset that this person that they don't know is going out and bringing healing and sanity and freedom in Jesus' name to people who are possessed by demons, and then he's not following them. You know, we never find out whether this person is a follower of Jesus. What we're told is that this person is not a follower of the disciples, and that seems to be John's issue. And so John comes to Jesus and he says, we were just trying to help, and you can thank us later, but we found this guy who was doing work in your name, and we didn't know who he was, so we told him to knock it off, because we assumed that if we didn't know who he was, you must not know who he was, and so we assumed that he must be working against us. And that's where we get some really tough words from Jesus. Because Jesus says to John, you want to talk about being against me? Being against me is denying others the opportunity to serve me. Being against me is placing obstacles in the way of people who are trying to follow me. As if Jesus wasn't clear enough last time. Jesus says that all it takes to follow him and to serve him is a willing heart. There is no entrance exam. There are no prerequisites. There is no prior experience required. Jesus throws the doors of discipleship wide open. And he invites the whole world to come and to follow him. And to be sure, those are tough words, but let's go there for a minute. Are there ways that we are keeping people from serving Jesus? Are there ways that we're keeping people from following Jesus because of unspoken, unwitting, maybe even well-intentioned requirements that we think are necessary, but Jesus doesn't. You know, what assumptions do we make about others and their capacity to serve Jesus or the sincerity of their desire to follow Jesus because they're not a part of our group? And yet we know that Jesus claims those people as his own, just as much as he claims us.
Here's another tough question. What are we doing that is making it hard for people to believe that the good news about Jesus is really true? And that the best thing that they can do with their lives is to devote their life to it. And let me say this. If you don't know the answers to those questions, let me encourage you to have a courageous conversation with your colleagues, with your neighbors, with your friends, and ask them. Because they will tell you. You know, these are tough words for us to hear, but as if that wasn't hard enough, Jesus takes it one step further. He goes one level deeper and he says, you want to really talk about what being against me looks like? It means being more concerned with the quality of other people's lives than your own. It means being more concerned about other people's priorities than your own. Being, means being willing to accept sin and brokenness in our own lives than in the lives of others. You're worried about whether other people are against me. What you need to be worried about is whether you are against me. And then Jesus uses this rather severe metaphor to demonstrate just how serious he really is about these questions. He says, if there is something that is causing you to sin, in other words, if there is something that is causing you to be against me, to keep you from following me, keeping you from believing in me, with everything that you have, with everything that you are, Cut it off, pluck it out, get rid of it, because even if it is as valuable to you as a hand or a foot or an eye, compared to Jesus and the value of following him, it is totally worthless. Jesus is saying with all seriousness, with all seriousness, that amputation is preferable to being against him. Now, Jesus is not telling us that we should all go out and sign up for amputations. I'm not even sure if hospitals around here are even doing elective surgeries right now. But what he is telling us is how serious he is about rooting out all the things in our lives that get in our way and hold us back from following him with everything that we have, everything that we are, every ounce of our being. In the words of one writer, disciples would rather undergo amputation than turn away from Jesus. And friends, I wonder, can we say the same things? Are we so committed to following Jesus that we would be willing to lose a limb or a promotion or a raise or a place on the team or our reputation or our comfort or whatever? Because it is holding us back from following Jesus with everything. Is following Christ so central to our being and our identities and our actions that if Jesus were somehow taken away from us, that we wouldn't know who we were or what to do with ourselves anymore? Or when something better comes along, when the 
inconvenience and the suffering and the cross-bearing that Jesus said is going to inevitably come as we follow him? Is living out our faith one of those things that we are more than capable of setting aside? until that situation passes. See, Jesus says, you're just trying to help me. But if you really want to help me, don't worry about whether other people are against me. If you really want to help, worry about whether you are really for me. This is tough stuff. These words of Jesus, they they cut deep. They're hard for us to hear. Jesus makes demands on our lives that are inconvenient and they are uncomfortable. They're costly. When Jesus calls us to be his disciples, he asks everything of us. And discipleship is not for the faint of heart. But here's the good news. Discipleship does not demand success. It demands faithfulness. Day in and day out, doing the work of following Jesus, giving it our best shot, waking up every morning and saying, today I will not stand against him, today I will stand for him. And the promise is, is that if this is our posture, the the door to discipleship, the entrance into Jesus' presence The arms of Jesus' embrace are wide open. And they're certainly open wide enough for you to come in and to find your place. See, Jesus knows we live this life of discipleship in fits and starts. He knows we don't always get it right. But Jesus promises us When we answer the call of discipleship, he will not turn us away. And friends, that's good news. Let's pray. Gracious God, we want to be your disciples. In our heart of hearts, that's really what we want. And yet so often we find ourselves with things that get in the way things in our lives that distract our attention away from you, things that appear to us to be brighter than the light that you shine in our lives, things that seem better to us than your love and your grace, things that are more attractive to us than your beauty, things we need more than to follow you. And yet over and over again, you tell us that the best thing that we can do with our lives is to give them over to you. God, help us to believe that. That you really do love us that much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Friends, let's pray together. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for your love. For love that reaches out to us, for love that won't let us go, for love that brings healing and reconciliation in our lives. Lord, we thank you that you love us so much that you include us in your work in the world. And we know that one of the best ways we can serve your world is to bring the cares and concerns of our lives and of our neighbors to you. We pray, Lord, for our world, for places of conflict, we pray for peace. Especially, Lord, we we think of Afghanistan and pray for peace and reconciliation and opportunity for residents there. We pray, gracious God, for those affected by natural disasters, floods, earthquakes, fires, drought, famine. We pray for those who are fleeing disasters, whether natural or man-made, and those who have no home to return to, those who have needed to leave their homes. We lift up to you, refugees, Lord, and especially refugees who are coming here close to home. We pray that they might have everything that they need. We pray, Lord, for our community, for schools and teachers, administrators and staff members. We pray for our doctors and nurses and hospitals. We pray for those who are in recovery from mental illness. Pray that you would bring healing and comfort to their lives. We pray for those in our own church family, Lord, those who have asked for our prayers, those who are near and dear to us, those who are in need of healing, those who are grieving, those who need to hear from you. And finally, Lord, we pray for ourselves, knowing that so often our prayers for ourselves live in our hearts, but they're so deep that we don't even have the words for them. And so we lift them up to you now in a time of silence. Gracious God, we pray these things with confidence that you love us, that you care for us. And we do that because we pray them in the name of Jesus, who lived for us and died for us and was raised for us. Amen. Friends, let's close our worship in a time of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for speaking to us in your word for this time where we get to gather virtually for the gifts of technology that keep us connected to each other and to you. We pray, Lord, as we go out from this time of worship, that your spirit would continue to mold our hearts and keep us close to you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Now hear and receive this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Friends, go in God's peace.